invite you to remain standing as you are able for the reading of our gospel today from Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 26. One day while he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting nearby. They had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Just then, some men came, carrying a paralyzed man on a bed. They were trying to bring him in and lay him before Jesus, but finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up to the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. When he, Jesus, saw their faith, he said, Friend! Your sins are forgiven you. Then the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, Who is this who is speaking blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their questionings, he answered them, Why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven you or to say, Stand up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the one who was paralyzed, I say to you, stand up and take your bed and go to your home. Immediately he stood before them, took what he had been lying on, and went to his home, glorifying God. Amazement seized all of them, and they glorified God and were filled in awe saying, we have seen strange things today. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I now invite you uh, to, uh, to be seated and uh, to join me in an attitude of prayer today. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I saw an image that came across my social media feed this week. It was a powerful image that really amazed me and really stood with me. It was the image, an image, of conjoined trees. Now I know that sounds very strange, but I want you to imagine this picture here just for a moment. There were these two trees that were growing next to each other. And from about halfway up, the trees looked completely normal. Their branches were growing, they were thriving. But if you looked at the bottom half of the trees, you would see something a little bit strange. You see, as the two trees were growing, the one on the left was actually growing a number of feet in the air. It had been cut off from its stump. But because its branches had begun to grow into and with and become intertwined with the other tree, it was able to grow along with that other tree. The other tree, you see, supported its neighbor, even though that neighbor was cut off from the ground below. These trees then were able to thrive, not just survive, but thrive as they grew together. Sometimes we would like to think that we grow on our own, that our lives, our work, even our faith is something that is ours alone, that it is ours alone to work at. And so we work hard, and we want to thrive on our own, but as people of faith, we know that we are not on our own. And I believe that that has been made more clear to us in this past year and a half than perhaps we ever realized it before. We have come to realize how deeply connected we are how much we deeply need one another to support each other, to care for each other, to sacrifice for each other, to be there for one another so that all of us, like those trees, can survive and can thrive. 
The song that was penned by John Lennon and Paul McCartney is true, that we get by with a little help from our friends. That is certainly true of the man who was paralyzed in today's scripture. Now, we don't know much about this man. We are not given a name. We are not told where he was from. We are not told his story, how he got to be where he is, how he got to be paralyzed. We don't know his experiences of that. And we certainly do not really have an inkling of his faith. We do know that his life at that time would have been a difficult one. Like it is difficult for one who is paralyzed today, though perhaps more so for him at that time. There were no technological advancements that made independence of any kind possible. And he would have been completely dependent on others, which was a challenge because for many in the ancient Near East at that time, and for many still today, there is a belief that if you are paralyzed, if you are even sick, that there is something that you have done, a sin that you have committed that caused that to come about. It is a sign of one sin, many believed. And therefore, there were many for whom this man could not have turned for help. It may have been a very isolating life for him to have lived. But in today's scripture, we do not encounter those who would have turned him away, but instead we encounter his friends. Friends who are so dear, friends who are so dedicated that they did all in their power to make sure that this man could come before Jesus. Their friendship, in their friendship, they did everything to make sure that he could survive and he could thrive just like those trees. At this point in our narrative, Jesus is still very early in his ministry. It is just the chapter previous where he has his inaugural sermon, where he says that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him and has anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That is the year of Jubilee, the year in which all debts were forgiven and all people were made free. Jesus has just preached this first sermon and then gone into his ministry, beginning to heal, beginning to live out that mission that he proclaimed in that first sermon. And as he does, as he begins to live out this ministry, he calls his first disciples in the scripture immediately following ours in Luke's gospel for today. And so he is early in this ministry of his, but word has already begun to spread. Word has begun to spread as people gather from far and near, aching, hungry for this hope, for this healing, for this message of life and empowerment that Jesus came to bring. People are so crowding him that this group of friends and their paralyzed friend cannot come in to see Jesus. But that does not stop him. The crowds do not stop them. They climb up onto the roof, Luke tells us, and they lower him down through the tiles on the roof. Now, this sounds simple enough, <laughs> but the roofs in ancient Near East did not come with chimneys, which it would have been difficult for a, a bed to get down a chimney anyway. Um, but they did not come with chimneys. They didn't have hatches or anything like that where it would have been easy to lower the man down. No, they would have had to literally dig through the roof in order to find, to make a hole to lower this man down. They would have had to dig through mud and through tiles, through thatching in order to lower him down through that roof. It would have been loud and it would have been distracting and they were taking a great risk there, right? After all, they are digging a hole in someone's roof that could go very poorly for them were they to be discovered. But their dedication and their faith that Jesus could bring healing to their friend was so great that they took that risk. And they used, I'm sure, a lot of sweat and hard labor 
to lower him down through that roof. And as they do, I can imagine that the crowd would have been muttering to themselves, what is going on? <laughs> what is going on? And how is it that they're jumping in line, right? We're all waiting to see Jesus. But instead of condemning them for their actions, Jesus commends them for their faith. When he saw their faith, Luke says, he said, friends, your sins are forgiven. The religious leaders begin to question him on how he can have the authority to forgive sins. And so then he offers an invitation for the man to get up and to walk. He heals him. And as he does, all of the people turn to one another and they say, what a strange story. What a strange thing we have seen. A strange thing we have seen. Now that's a little bit of an understatement, if I do say so, right? Imagine being there on that day. That would have been more than strange. That would have been, as other translations translate this passage, remarkable. We have seen remarkable things. Now, as I said, we don't know a lot about this man that was coming for healing. We don't know if he had faith or if it was simply the faith of his friends who bring him. I imagine that as a man who had lived in those difficult circumstances in which he found himself, his faith may have been a little rough around the edges. It may have been a little difficult. I imagine that perhaps he had found himself not wanting to get his hopes up for this healing after living so many, after living years, presumably, in this condition. We don't know about this man, but we do know that the healing and forgiveness that he has offered does not rely on his faith. It is not his faith, interestingly enough, that Jesus praises when he is laid before the Lord. No, Jesus doesn't say, your faith, sir, has made you well. But Luke tells us when Jesus saw their faith, when he saw the faith and dedication of this man's friends, he forgave his sins and he healed him. It is not only this man's faith that saves him, but it is the grace of Jesus. It isn't our faith or lack of faith that saves us but it is by the grace of our Lord. And here, this man's friend's tenacity was a living embodiment of the grace of God. Their faith led him to God's grace. Their faith led him to healing. At a previous church I served, we had a worship series that we called Acts of Faith. And each week we were exploring the early apostles through the book, The Acts of the Apostles in the Bible. And as we explored the faith of these earliest Christians, we also had an opportunity for those in our congregation to share their faith journeys with us. And one week on the week of Mother's Day, I had invited um, a mother in our congregation to share her faith story with us. It was a powerful faith story as a mother because she had the unique perspective of a mother with a very sick child. Her daughter was a very young child who had a very rare form of epilepsy. It was PCDH-19 epilepsy, and she had had more seizures in the first five years of her life than many of us can ever imagine. They had been in and out of hospitals for, for these early years of her life over and over and over again. And the doctors would try to alter medication to keep uh, the symptoms at bay, but there is no cure for PCDH-19 epilepsy. And so this young girl's mother shared in her faith story that her faith had taken a beating over the years. 
as she saw her little girl fighting in the hospital, as she saw her hooked up to machines, as she saw her sedated as they worked to try and, and fundraise for research for a cure for this form of this disease, she had found herself shaken. But she told the congregation that when her faith was shaken, it was those around her that helped her find it again, that helped to get her on solid ground once more. Her faith was shaken, but when she would send out a text message to friends saying, I am struggling today. My daughter is struggling today. They would respond with prayers. They would respond with words of reassurance. And when she told them, I don't even know if I can pray today, will you pray for me? Will you pray on my behalf for my daughter? Will you have faith for me today? She said that they showed up and they gave her faith when her faith was struggling. Through them, she said, she found the grace of God. Our faith and our lives of relationships with Jesus and with one another, our faith lives are indeed personal, right? We do indeed seek to have a personal relationship with Jesus, but our lives of faith are not only personal. As people of faith, we are part of a community of faith. We are part of a church body. And collectively, our faith is in that of Jesus Christ. We all have moments where we find ourselves in need of more faith. We all have moments where we find ourselves in fear and in anxiety, where we find ourselves struggling, where we find ourselves in need of healing, in need of words of reassurance, and in need of the grace of God. And the best news of all in scripture is that the very definition of the grace of God is that there is nothing that we have to do to earn that grace. That the grace of God is bigger than we can imagine. That the grace of God not only comes to us when we dig through roofs, but the grace of God bursts through roofs. That it is so much bigger. And that when our faith is lacking, we don't need to worry that that faith is not enough. We can turn to others, we can turn to God and the invitation is there for grace to transform our lives. In times like these that we are going through as a community in a world right now, it can seem as if we just don't have enough faith as if there's not enough faith to go around. We can find ourselves plagued with anxieties and fears about the safety of our loved ones, about the safety of our community for this disease that we thought we were gonna conquer sooner. As we see us having to make difficult decisions about reducing the numbers and requiring registration and worship and asking us to mask up again it may be seen by some as a lack of faith. But I believe that what this story teaches us is that it is faith that keeps us caring for one another. That it is faith that keeps us seeking to bring healing and wholeness to one another. That it is faith that unites us in the power of the grace of our Lord Jesus so that people can thrive so that our world can thrive, so that lives can be transformed and made whole. I believe that this story teaches us that the grace of God is not dependent on us. We may come out of this scripture today asking, comparing ourselves to the people in the story. Do I have enough faith? Am I a good enough friend? Do I have enough tenacity to get to Jesus? 
But I think if we ask those questions, we're asking the wrong question. Because while we do have this scripture that tells us of these friends and of this man, the majority of the scripture passage for today is not about them, but it is about Jesus. It is him that we need to be asking, is the grace of God enough? And if we look in scripture, the answer is always yes. In the face of our fears and our anxieties, our doubts and our struggles, our isolation and our loneliness, the grace of God meets us there, wherever we are to offer transformation, to offer healing. And we as the people of God should be tenacious in that grace. The grace that bursts through roofs to get to us. So this week, I invite us all to have faith for one another, to care for one another, to offer grace to one another and bear witness to the grace and healing power of Jesus that calls us to do all of those things. And I believe truly that if we do that, if we can really delve into and accept that invitation to grace that Jesus offers us, if we can share that with one another and with the world, then we and our loved ones and our community and our world can experience new life and transformation. It is my hope and my prayer that as we share and participate in the grace of God, that we too can say, <laughs> Like those who were gathered on that day, we have seen strange and remarkable things. May it be so. Amen.